Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Linda Lee. Um, I'm the coordinator for Passion Study Group Seattle. And um, I just had some household announcements before we begin our program. Um, first of all, the restrooms are down um, in the hallway, the women's right across this room, the men's down the hallway. Um, parking, um, street parking is um, recommended. Um, you can park anywhere um, for as long as you, you can. Um, the parking lot here um, have some or many stalls that are reserve parking, like 24-hour reserve. So um, please do not park uh, in those spaces. Uh, you will be towed. Uh, however, you can park on the ones that say the two-hour two parking ones. You, you may park in those. <clears throat> Um, scheduled for uh, this weekend, um, morning session 10 to noon, uh, afternoon session is 2 to 4. Um, let's see, these um, teachings today, uh, morning and afternoon sessions are being webcast, uh, so they are being viewed by many, many people uh, in many, many locations. And I'd like to thank uh, Jeffrey for all his help in making that happen. Um, cell phones, please have your cell phones turned off. It's just a reminder. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so I would like to thank Barter Tuku Rinpoche for accepting our invitation to once again come to Seattle uh, to teach. Um, many of you um, are already familiar with uh, Rinpoche. Um, he has been coming to Seattle to teach Dharma um, for many years, um, since the early 2000s and even earlier than that. Um, so he has many students in this area. And uh, we are very fortunate um, that Rinpoche is able to come all the way from Red Hook, um, New York, upstate New York, uh, uh, to teach here. So thank you, Rinpoche. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Lama Yeshe Gyantso, um, wonderful translator. Uh, without him, um, we would not understand um, many things. Um, and so we'd like to thank Lama Yeshe for coming, uh, accompanying Rinpoche and for translating. Thank you. And we also have um, Rinpoche's wife, Sonam, accompanying this time. And also Lama Nima, Rinpoche's attendant. So welcome to Seattle, Namanima. This is his first trip out to the West. Um, also would like to thank all our volunteers, hardworking volunteers um, who um, put um, a lot of effort into making this happen. <clears throat> I wanted to take the time to um, uh, tell you a little bit about Barter Rinpoche, um, even if you may know his background. Um, Bharat Rinpoche, Bharat Tuku Rinpoche, was born in Kham in East Tibet, and he was recognized by His Holiness the 16th Gyalakamapa as the third incarnation of Techem Bawe Dorje, who is the incarnation of Nupchen Sanje Yeshe, one of the 25 principal disciples of Guru Rinpoche. And Nupchen Sanje Yeshe, this is his statue here. <clears throat> Uh, Rinpoche and his family fled Tibet during a communist invasion. Sadly, all of Rinpoche's fam family members did not survive this difficult journey. Rinpoche was eventually recognized by the 16th Gyalakamapa and was enthroned at Rumtek Monastery in Sikkim, where he received formal training and study under the 16th Kamapa's guidance. Bharat Rinpoche accompanied the 16th Karmapa on his world tours in 1974 and 1976. In 1977, His Holiness asked Rinpoche to remain in Woodstock, New York at Karmatriyana Dharma Chakra, the main seat of His Holiness Karmapa, and where Rinpoche stayed for the next 30 plus years fulfilling the Guru's wish, uh, his Guru's wish and helping to establish KTD as well as various affiliate centers in the U.S. 
There is an interesting story about how Kunzang Pa Chen Ling came about. Before the 16th Karmapa passed away, he sent Bardo Rinpoche a note. The note said, Dear Bardo Rinpoche, my prayer that the teaching of your Dharma may fill Jambuvipa is always in my mind all day and night. Do not be timid about this. Be earnest. I pray that I see you soon. Karmapa. Rinpoche saved this note, although at the time he was unsure as to its meaning. In 1999, Rinpoche had a very vivid dream of the 16th Karmapa in which the Karmapa told him to look after his own lineage, the lineage of Terchen Bawe Dorje. In the waking state, Rinpoche strongly felt the Karmapa's presence to the extent that he could perceive the Karmapa's smell. This dream helped Bhartatuka Rinpoche decide that it was time to look after his lineage. In 2000, with the blessing from His Holiness the 17th Karmapa and His Eminence, the 12th Taisitu Rinpoche, Rinpoche established Rakchu Foundation in order to help rebuild the Rakchu Monastery, which is Rinpoche's monastery in Tibet, and also provide educational facilities for the monks and nuns lay community as well as a health and dental clinic. In 2003, Rinpoche established Kunsan Pauchenling, which is located in Red Hook, New York. And today, KPL is very near completion and has an active roster of Dharma programs, including visiting teachers such as His uh, Eminence Garcha Rinpoche, Her, Her Eminence Kanjo Rinpoche, and recently His Eminence Garwang Rinpoche. In addition, KPL has been blessed by several visits by His Holiness 17th Gyalwa Karmapa. Rinpoche also continues to travel to various Pauchin study groups and centers throughout the U.S. In short, Rinpoche has helped establish and rebuild KTD Rakchuo Monastery in Tibet and Kunzam Pauchin Ling, in addition to his teaching schedule and raising three beautiful daughters. So at this time, Rinpoche kindly turn the wheel of Dharma this weekend and please accept our request. ตะนี้ทันดะมรังเกลาบันดาวะเรตัสสะสะเจตัยจิงหวะยันตะชะตาปะติสะวะลัมมะกัมมะปะจุโตรังจงริปุโตเจเกทุกเกกอมบัตต
Well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank, where is, oh, there you are, thank Linda for um, her extremely full and detailed account of my life up to now. Um, it was very accurate. As, as she mentioned during her introduction, um, I served my root guru, the 16th Joan Karmapa, Ramjurik Bidorje, for uh, many, many years. But also, as she also mentioned, it was his vision and intention that eventually I take up the responsibility with which I was born for the preservation and dissemination of the many treasures of my predecessor, Terchambal Vidurje. In order to do this, um, I consulted both His Holiness the 17th Joan Kamapa and His Eminence the 12th Taisitu Rinpoche and requested uh, their advice and their permission to create Kunzang Pantin Ling as a venue for the establishment of the uh, practice, regular practice, uh, of uh, these many treasures. And we've been able to uh, do this due to the kindness of uh, Lama Tashi Tobjo, who has taught, and Yishi Jomso, who has translated these treasures uh, into English. Now, when I say that we've established the practice of these treasures, you have to understand that in their most elaborate form, some of them, particularly the what are regarded as the three principal cycles, which are the Yamantaka cycle, the Vajrakila cycle, and the Vajrayogini cycle, that in some formats, these practices can, the liturgies can be between three and 400 pages long and require between 18 and 24 hours uh, to perform at a sitting. Obviously, that is not practical in this situation, but as uh, recommended by both His Holiness and His Eminence, we have established the regular and intensive practice of these cycles in an intermediate format that is neither excessively long nor excessively abbreviated. In addition, 
His Holiness, the Jaon Karmapa, has visited us three times. His Eminence, Taisutu Rinpoche, came this past year and consecrated our principal shrine. And as Linda also mentioned, we've had uh, visits from His uh, Eminence Garchen Rinpoche, Garwang Rinpoche, Kondra Rinpoche, and many masters with whom uh, I'm familiar and have uh, strong samaya. And I'm confident that we will continue to be visited uh, by these teachers uh, in the coming years. ตันเดลายังเตตตาตุลาเดเปกกัปสุลาสามบุตินิเลปสาวะริสเลปสาวะริเตนายังพันซัมเจนิมาเลนิอนาคันซัมจุโซดาวะจิลุยอบะริตัน
I would like to especially welcome all of you here and offer you my best wishes. ทอปันดาวเกเปนาทันดาวดอยองสัมเบกเรวาตังตังอนิกมาวปาลาริมยันดอลาชูดาเดวาทอปนิโซซุเกยูลายอเบกเรคัมเตวาชิกุญญ์
My hope in establishing a s study groups like this one, this Pachin study group, is that the study groups serve to facilitate each individual who uh, participates in it to um, receive the blessings of their respective root guru and especially to facilitate their being able to uh, fully hear and study and practice Dhamma in this life so that through both their connection and their practice they be able to reveal their own Buddha nature and be of immeasurable benefit to countless others. So this is the idea. This is the plan or the vision behind the establishment of study groups like this one. And this is reflected, I think, in the liturgy uh, that we use at the beginning and end of a teaching sessions. You'll notice that we began this morning by reciting together the lineage supplication that was composed by Penga Jumbo Zangpo. And essentially the purpose of this supplication is to request the blessings of our root guru, Vajradhara, and his lineage, so that those blessings enter our hearts. Following that, since we are uh, Buddhists, and especially since we are practitioners of the Mahayana, we take refuge and generate bodhicitta. We do so using a single stanza. The first two lines are a short form of the refuge vow. And you say, to the Buddha, 
dharma, and supreme, asse supreme assemblies, I go for refuge until awakening. That is the Mahayana vow of refuge. And then in the second two lines, when you say, through my practice of generosity and the rest, referring to the six perfections, may I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. That is the generation of bodhicitta. And this initial generation of bodhicitta at the, at the beginning of any session, whether it be a session of Dharma practice, listening to Dharma, or study, is very powerful because it totally alters the effect of what we then do. It said that if a single moment of the thought of bodhicitta had physical form, its merit would be greater, or if the merit of it had physical form, its size would be greater than all the space in the universe. So in short, whether we engage in long or short sessions of listening, discussion, or practice, it's important that our motivation be bodhicitta. Then in order to further train our minds, we recite and hopefully contemplate as we are reciting them the aspirational form of the four immeasurables. The four immeasurables are immeasurable love, the desire that all beings be happy and accumulate causes of happiness, immeasurable compassion, the desire that all beings be free from suffering and its causes, immeasurable joy, the lighting in any joy or causes of joy that beings experience, and immeasurable equanimity or impartiality, having these attitudes equally without distinguishing between near and far or friends and enemies for all beings. And then uh, we recite the four dharmas of Gampopa. Again, this is phrased as a, as a prayer or an aspiration, but it is also a contemplation. The aspiration that one's mind go to the dharma, the dharma become a path, that the path dispel delusion, and finally, that delusion be transformed into or replaced by wisdom. Now then you might ask, why after that do we then recite the seven-line supplication to Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padmasambhava, along with the taking of empowerment? As Linda mentioned, my root guru recognized me as the rebirth of Nupjin Sanjay Yeshe, and in particular of his uh, reincarnation, the Tetran Bhavar Dorje. Now, Nupjin Sanjay Yeshe was, in the 8th and early 9th centuries, a direct disciple of Guru Rinpoche. And Tetran Bhavar Dorje discovered nine volumes of Guru Rinpoche's teachings as a treasure. Now, Linda mentioned the note that the, His Holiness, the 16th Karmapa, sent to me, saying, may your dharma fill the world. At the time, as she also mentioned, I wasn't sure exactly what he meant by my dharma. We all have the same dharma. It's the dharma of the Buddha. So I assumed he meant, may I work hard to cause the Buddha dharma, generically, to fill the world. I thought, I don't have any special dharma. But over time, I realized that he was referring to the teachings of Guru Rinpoche, which were transmitted by him to both Yeshe Tsojo and Nupjin Sanjay Yeshe, and by them to their combined emanation, Jechen Bhavar Dorje. So we recite that supplication in the hopes of it facilitating our fulfillment together of His Holiness, the 16th Karmapa's vision, that these teachings come to flourish without obstacle. Now, at the end of the session, the last thing we will recite is a four-line aspiration written by Kinchin Mipam. A Mipam who lived from 1846 until the year 1912 
was the most famous Nyingma master of the end of the 19th and turn of the 20th century. And as he was a uh, friend and admirer of Terchambawi Dorje, he wrote this aspiration that the teachings, the treasures of Barwe Dorje, uh, again, fill the world. So we make these uh, prayers um, in order, at the beginning and end, in order that His Holiness's aspiration uh, be fulfilled. And for my part, although I don't regard myself as an, as an especially capable or courageous person, I have done and I'm doing my best by establishing Kunzang Po Jin Ling uh, and its affiliates, which consist of a formal centers called Kunzang Chuling and study groups like this one called uh, Palchen uh, Study Group. And my hope uh, is, to put it bluntly, that the existence of these as venues and groups really help you. So, so, la song yabeke, tang, gumbum yodi, gumbum taken nani yang, ta, tanda gumbum de davojita, lapio senata, tang another thing, gola, chuke, chuke, a porogram davozoari, then stay into castle tang and ake, kare, shehen davojita, lapins. Now, our, our actual subject um, here, uh, aside from commenting on, on, <laughs> on this introduction, <laughs> is um, one of the songs of Tershin Bawa Dorje. Now, um, the collected songs of teachers can in some cases be things they wrote more or less to themselves on retreat or for all their disciples and so on. But what's one of the things that is remarkable about most of the songs in this collection, uh, the collection from which this is drawn, is that most of them, including this one, were written for individual disciples, which meant, uh, in some cases, the request is included. Here it isn't. That the individual disciple asked for a song that covered certain specific points or certain material. So therefore, the song is designed for the needs of that disciple, in this case, someone called Karma Yeshe. And that means that it will, they vary quite a bit uh, in uh, what they cover and also in the level uh, of practice that is assumed on the part of the listener or, or reader. But you have chosen uh, the, this song, If Your Heart Seeks Dharma. Um, you should know that the songs don't have names with about three exceptions. We gave them names in the English translation so that people could find them. And the name is usually the first line, as is the case here. So it didn't actually have a name. Namun guru ye ning ni chola chopana covid nende nende sumbayin joshe ni yung jiwata Make it your body in the bones and some Namonguru said, Tachatanga, Sanghag, Lam Tela, Lama Sanghe, Lama Cho, Lama Bandi, and Dorian Chang. Going to Chebo, Lama, Lama Nam, the Chancellor, Kadu, Yena, Anthony, Sanghe, Tom Jake, Ta, De Mount, Tata, to some Sanghe, Tom Jake, Pando, Yontin, Tom Jake, the Dupic, Dani, Ta. Lama tela tazo zondo yore te in the chansalos, namo, sula chantan, guru las, guru yes, somari dos, ning ne chula choba nas, tamonege, jigdenge, chawasinkin tela, kora, tarsinkin de tawan in the yamaris, chaji chibuk de monda, teni lena mejo. Yan shows and so on. What is Java the Lega singing the Ugu Git? That's the most is the one that was in an authority. Or is that tell a cassette? Lea Yenayam 
ตาเทเรงเตเนงะรังเกงเกงเกจาวากังกะดิโยซงสตาเนนะเลยาเจกะลุมะซงสิเกเดตาวานเนยอมารีซุสุเกเซมเกตาเจเนกะดิยาวาน
ジョンダンジョンダンタマセトンアンチャラマガギジボメギジボントロシャセンソマリーダテインドカプソラペナテニズンパンカプソラテニデンバンタワタンタマパンカプソラペンセンメリパヨナコンバデンバチャバタン
that if we keep doing the same thing we've been doing, nothing is going to change. Our pain is not going to go away. The understanding that this leads to is the recognition that mundane actions are never-ending. There is a saying in Tibetan, worldly deeds are like the play of children. They will never come to an end until the children stop playing. We never finish any project. It always leads to another project and that to another. So either two things happen with every uh, worldly ambition and every worldly endeavor. Either it fails, which happens at least half the time, or it succeeds but leads to some other endeavor as a result. There is no point in our lives at which we can say, okay, that's, well, that's done. That's just over. I don't need that anymore. That point only comes through our own decision. That's why he says, if your heart seeks dharma, give up samsaric activities. Now, he's referring here to the need not to necessarily isolate ourselves from the world and abandon our responsibilities, but to the need to come to a decision that this stuff is not what I'm going to live for anymore. And that decision comes from the recognition that samsara and samsaric deeds are beginningless and therefore potentially endless. We have done everything and been everything except achieve awakening. And nothing we've done up to now has done us that much good because we're still in pain. That decision, in turn, leads to what's described in the next line, where he says, generate sadness and renunciation. Sadness is the recognition that attempting to make yourself feel better by manipulating circumstances in the world is always ultimately unsuccessful. And we call it sadness because initially it makes you feel sad. You've been doing something as long as you can remember and probably far longer that has never worked. Renunciation here actually refers to the desire for freedom. When you feel, and there's, Rimshay said, there's a causal relationship between these. When you feel sadness toward the failure of samsaric endeavors, that naturally inspires a desire for freedom from samsara. Now renunciation here, the desire for freedom, does not mean, Rinpoche said, that you have to give up everything and isolate yourself from others and from your previous responsibilities. It means that you come to a resolution that you are not going to allow this life to go to waste the way many of our previous lives must have. And that even if I cannot stop my involvement with my worldly responsibilities and my life, I am definitely going to focus on the practice of Dharma in order to achieve liberation. So renunciation here doesn't mean giving external things up. It means giving up the internal thing of believing in samsara as its own solution. Now that brings us to the next line, which addresses the practical question, OK, I've decided I want to achieve liberation from samsara. And I've recognized that most of what I've done up to now has come to nothing. What change, what real change should I make in my life? And the first step is, he writes, cast the ten wrongdoings far away. Regardless of our desire for freedom, 
if we continue to act badly to harm others. Nowadays, in the West, we use the expression act badly sort of humorously. You know, we say that, what is it, um, only women who act badly are, are remembered in history or something like that, which is a term of admiration. But here he's talking about 10 forms of wrongdoing that are not admirable. And the reason why we need to recognize these things is these are 10 things that we can stop doing. And by stopping them, we can change the course, not just of our lives, but of our future. If, on the other hand, we don't stop these things, then regardless of our desire for freedom, it's not going to happen. Things are just going to get worse. Corresponding to stopping these things, and we'll get into what these things are, but we'll look at them from their positive side, which is their antitheses. He says, undertake the 10 good deeds. Now, there are more than 10 things we can do wrong. And there are also, therefore, more than 10 things we can do right. But the 10 things that are wrongdoing and that are good deeds cover, if you take them along with the things that go along with them, cover most of the territory. And that's why this list is valuable. In fact, the first significant event, aside from the, discovery, the, uh, the beginning of the study of the sutras in Tibetan Buddhism, was when the first of the three great Dharma kings of the imperial period, Songtsen Gampo, changed the legal system of Tibet so that the laws were no longer based entirely on feudal allegiance and so on, but on an objective moral standard. And he drew his laws based on this a Buddhist notion of the 10 good deeds and the 10 forms of wrongdoing. So we need, Rimshe said, to look at them. The idea is to replace the wrongdoing with the corresponding right doing. And the corresponding good deed, of course, has two aspects. One is abstention from the wrongdoing, and the other one is the positive performance of its antithesis. So there are three of body. The first is killing. Um, killing is wrong. The antithesis of killing is twofold. It's to not kill, but also to save lives, to do what you can to save lives. And that, by extension, that includes things like preserving the environment, which causes the lives of beings to be saved, and so on. The second physical wrongdoing is to steal, to take that which you know is not yours. The antithesis of that is not only not to steal, but to be generous, to give to those in need. And the third one is adultery. And the antithesis of that is to be uh, faithful and honest in your relationships, to be moral. Then there are four of speech. The first one is uh, to lie. So the antithesis of that, the positive one, is to be, always be honest in your speech. The second one is um, to cause a discord. And this means to intentionally um, say something to one person that, or, that will cause them to uh, not like uh, another person. And we do that. We don't have one word for it in English, but it's something we all know very, very well. And the opposite of that is to use your speech to heal division and in, and in, in mediation. The third one is abusive speech. And that's where you, you in any way, whether it's the words you use, the tone you use, or your intention, you use your speech to hurt someone else intentionally. The antithesis of that is to speak gently and appropriately. And the fourth one is gossip. And um, gossip is particularly bad, not just because it distracts people, because it usually segues into the second one, it usually becomes divisive. So the antithesis is, tr traditional thing is instead of gossiping, Recite mantras, or chant a practice, or do something positive with your speech. The, the notion is, 
if you have time to gossip, there must be something better you could be doing with your time. Now, the three of mind are um, covetousness, malice, and wrong view. Covetousness is wanting something that belongs to somebody else. And the antithesis to that is twofold. It's contentment, and it's also mental generosity, the willingness to give uh, to others. Malice is uh, seeking the harm or uh, of any kind of others. And the antithesis of that is benevolence, wanting others to be happy. And wrong view, in this case, is particularly the notion that what you do doesn't matter. And the antithesis of that right view is the recognition that everything we think, say, and do matters, that, uh, which is the belief in the results of actions or, or karma. Now, he concludes this section by saying, keep the prati moksha vows. Prati means individual, or, uh, and moksha means liberation. So these are the basic Buddhist vows common uh, to all traditions. They basically, they have several different forms, but basically they, compis, they consist of either upasaka, uh, shramanera, or shramanerika, in the case of a female, and it's upasuka or upasika, in the, and uh, bhikshu and bhikshuni. Upasaka refers to the vow of um, a, a lay person, a person who is still uh, not, uh, who, or is never going to be a monastic. There is certain, there is definitely um, uh, basic vows for anyone. For example, when you take the common vow of refuge, that is a form of upasaka vow. So there's the upasaka vow of just holding the, the threefold refuge, the upasaka vow to abstain from one or more of five specific actions. And then shamanera is often translated as novice, but it doesn't mean that. It means it's, a, it's the first of two levels of monastic ordination. It's identical for men and women, where there are, broadly speaking, 10 and in detail, 36 uh, vows. And then bhikshu, bhikshu means uh, almsman or almswoman, someone who lives only on alms. That's what it means. Bhiksha is alms or, or uh, something that's given to a beggar. So it, it's understood as uh, someone who lives uh, by begging, and that is the highest level of monastic ordination. So whichever of these you practice, you, 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 you choose, you choose something that, that you will be able to keep. So he says, keep the pratimoksha vows. And he concludes, this is the practice of the Hinayana. Now, there is not and never has been a school of Buddhism called Hinayana. Hinayana is a term used by the Mahayana tradition to denote the practice of Buddhism before the generation of bodhicitta, de la satyashuku. Uh -huh. Hinayana does not refer to the Theravadan tradition or to any other tradition. It refers to basic Buddhism. Lesser vehicle means that you have not yet generated bodhicitta. But there's still all of this practice and all of these important steps can be made before that. ยังเป็นเอ่อยังยกเส้นก็จะยกเส้นนะตรงทําไปยังยกเส้นถ้าก็จะยกเส้นนะยังมันไปยังยกเส้นนะยกไปยังเส้นนะยกไปยังเส้
Jimba Chutum Zopa don't do something heroic paro de Jimba Topote Taka say in a yam. A lap top gogri, Stalete, Lapa in a tin, tiny taking yam ning and nana, tiny at them, but take by Chimbug in yam nila do it. Tiny than them, but say Gamarilla, the Jude Senitica. Oh, you're tiny to her. Or that they are Tesson Yana. Oh, that's. That did bother. Now, the next three lines deal with the first uh, aspect of the Mahayana. Uh, the Mahayana, or greater vehicle, is distinguished by the motivation with which it is practiced, and that is the motivation of bodhicitta. But there are two ways in which the Mahayana can be practiced, and one is called the vehicle of causal attributes or characteristics, and the other way is called uh, the resultant vehicle of mantra or tantra. Since the motivation and indeed much of the practice of the causal vehicle must be incorporated into the practice of the resultant vehicle, uh, he deals with that uh, first. Now first he says, meditate on altruistic bodhicitta. Bodhi means awakening and citta means mind. Altruistic bodhicitta here, the use of the adjective altruistic, means that uh, Tejan Bharadorje is referring to bodhicitta here in its most common usage, which is the altruistic intention to achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of others. But in fact, that is only one of um, three aspects of bodhicitta because there are two aspects of bodhicitta, and one of those has two aspects, too. Bodhicitta is the mind of awakening. And um, it actually refers to the awakened mind, the mind of a bodhisattva uh, or of a Buddha. But when we first generate it, we generate it not in the form of awakening, but in the form of the aspiration or intention to achieve that awakening for the benefit uh, of others. So this is a case of something very, very common in Buddhism, which is uh, applying the name of a result to its cause. So when we as beginners first give rise to the intention, I am going to achieve Buddhahood, for the benefit of all other beings. That is the cause, the definite and certain cause of your future Buddhahood. So therefore, we call it bodhicitta, or the awakened mind. But it's not actual awakening. So therefore, we call it the relative bodhicitta. And relative bodhicitta has two aspects. That aspiration, just described, and the implementation of that aspiration. The aspiration is the thought, I will achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all other beings. And implementation is your commitment to doing whatever it is you have to do in order to achieve that awakening. Now, this aspiration and implementation are both short of actual awakening in the beginning. So they're, they're both called a relative bodhicitta. The relationship between aspiration and implementation bodhicitta is described by Shantideva in his Bodhicharavatara as analogous to the relationship between a plan to go somewhere and actually going. Aspiration bodhicitta is like the thought, I'm going on pilgrimage to Lhasa, and uh, implementation bodhicitta is making the journey. Now, when someone achieves the first bodhisattva level, their relative bodhicitta is transformed into what's called absolute bodhicitta. And then when they achieve Buddhahood, it's called the fruitional uh, bodhicitta. So everything that we generate in the beginning is relative bodhicitta. But because it is the cause of absolute bodhicitta, uh, it is fit to be called bodhicitta. And if you want to learn about this, Rimshe said, the relationship between aspiration and implementation and between relative and absolute bodhicitta and between the generation of bodhicitta as a beginner and its result 
in perfect awakening because that result is certain from the moment that you first generate it. You can delay it by screwing up, but you can't prevent it. Um, read Shantideva's Bodhicharavatara, and especially, it would be good to read the commentary, especially on the ninth chapter by uh, Kempo Kunzang Paldin. And um, then he says, the second line, cultivate the six perfections as best you can. The main practices of implementation bodhicitta are what are called the six paramitas, which means transcendent virtues, uh, or conventionally the six perfections. These are given in a sequence of difficulty and also uh, a causal sequence. The first is generosity, which is the easiest to practice. The second is moral discipline. And moral discipline is, is made easier by the non-attachment acquired through the practice of generosity. The third is patience, which is easier to practice on the basis of moral discipline. The fourth is diligence, which is uh, made easier through patience. The fifth is meditative stability, the actual practice of meditation, which requires diligence. And the sixth is knowledge or insight, which really, finally, can only come uh, through the practice of meditation. And he concludes, this is the practice of the Mahayana of characteristics. All aspects of the practice of the causal vehicle, what's called the Mahayana of the sutras or of causal attributes, are contained in the generation of bodhicitta and the practice of the six perfections. This vehicle is called the Mahayana of causal attributes because it is, it is the practice of generating the causes of awakening, the initial generation of bodhicitta, and the subsequent practice of the six perfections. So that completes his explanation of the causal uh, Mahayana. And then he turns to an overview of the resultant Mahayana of which we typically call a Vajrayana. It has many different names. It's called the resultant vehicle, the mantra vehicle, the tantra vehicle, the Vajra vehicle or Vajrayana, and so on. These are all in Buddhism uh, synonymous. It's called the resultant vehicle because to varying degrees, depending upon the level and form of Vajrayana practice, instead of merely attempting to generate the causes of awakening, in addition to that, not, none of these vehicles wipe out the previous one. So it's not, like, it's not like when you generate bodhicitta, you can go back and do the ten unvirtuous actions, or when you begin vajrayana practice, you give up bodhicitta. It's cumulative. But in addition to the generation of the causes of awakening, bodhicitta and the practice of the six perfections, you employ med methods of meditation which are either similitudes of or the actual evidence of the fruition. And that's why it's called the resultant vehicle. Now, there are six levels of this, which is why we have what are called the nine vehicles. There are two levels or forms of the Dumbo de Jugi Lungji, Chitlapna Consolo, Atikopaga Junere, the big go a lavorci. The easiest way to understand the nine vehicles. Um, is um, a quotation that's from a, a great perfection tantra called the Great Array of Ati. And there are several quotations from it that you find all over uh, in uh, many different schools. Um, but it provides a very concise definition of the difference between the vehicles. First it says, Chiba Nangpa Chamdroche. The difference between a Buddhist and non-Buddhist is the vow of refuge. 
You take refuge in the three jewels. You're a Buddhist. If you don't, you're not. It's very simple. Then, nyintu rangja lameche. There are two forms of what we pejoratively call Hinayana. They're properly called Shravakayana, which means the vehicle of the hearers. And the other is called Prajika Buddhayana, which means the vehicle of solitary uh, realized ones. A Shravaka is a person who practices Buddhism, but does not generate bodhicitta as their motivation. It doesn't matter whether they're practicing in the Theravadan tradition or in a, in, a, in a so-called Mahayana tradition. The sutras that are recognized by the Theravadan school do talk about bodhisattvas, do talk about the intention to achieve Buddhahood. They just say not everyone should do it. Some people should become arhats and other people can do that. There is less difference between the different Buddhist schools than we sometimes think. But the difference between, so Shravaka, the first Shravakas were the Buddha's disciples who heard Buddhism from the Buddha. And that's why they're called Shravakas, or hearers. And anyone who practices Buddhism but does not generate bodhicitta is a Shravaka. A Pratyeka Buddha is a person who figures this stuff out on their own. And they typically it's said that they, uh, they see a part or all of a skeleton and they think, where did that come from? And they go, well, that came from death. That's a dead body. Well, what caused death? Sickness or violence. And what allowed sickness to happen? Well, that's aging. And what caused that? Birth. Well, what caused birth? Becoming. And they reason back through the 12 links of interdependence and come to the discovery that the cause of all of this is ignorance. And then they, on their own, they eliminate ignorance. So those, the, the difference between those two in the quotation is the first type, shravakas, have gurus, and the second type don't. So the difference between the shravaka and prachika buddhayanas is the presence or absence, respectively, of a guru. It's very simple. So then, tegpa chi jung semjeche, the difference between the hinayana and the mahayana is bodhicitta. If you generate bodhicitta, then... If that's your intention, you're practicing Mahayana. If you've not generated bodhicitta, you're practicing the common vehicle. Then the tseni sangha laiche, the difference between the causal Mahayana and the resultant or fruitional Mahayana, the Vajrayana, is deities. In causal Mahayana, you recognize the Buddha and the existence of other Buddhas and there are bodhisattvas and so on, but you don't imagine deities the way we do in Vajrayana practice. Now, we come to the, uh, the, the, the next two lines describe what are called the three outer or three lower tantras. Um, the discussion here gets a little complicated because there were two periods of translation from Sanskrit into Tibetan. What's called the early period, which began during the reign of King Sonsen Gampo and ended with, you know, they had to decide when, does, when we consider this to be over with the time of a translator called Rinchen Tsongpo. And so basically, it was the 8th and 9th centuries, and because not much was done in the 10th. And then the later period, which was from the 11th century uh, onward. And some of the material they translated was different, and some of the terminology they used in translating it was different. So Techen Bawe Dorji here is going to guide us through this, the the swamp or forest of confusion that this can cause. Because in the new translation school, they talk about four levels of tantra and admit that the, the, the fourth and highest can have three, two or three levels. In the old translation school, they talk about six levels of tantra. So in the new translation school, the first three levels are called the lower tantras, in the old translation school, they're called the outer tantras. The outer tantras are called outer because they emphasize externals, externals <coughs> of behavior. And here, Techon Bawadorje says, there are three outer tantras which emphasize actions, conduct, and samadhi, respectively. The first of these is called uh, action tantra, or kriya tantra. The second is called charya tantra, which means charya means behavior or, or conduct. 
And the third is called Yoga Tantra. Yoga should be understood in the Buddhist usage to mean not just, I mean, in, 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 in generic Indian religious usage, it means union, union with the divine, union with something. But in the Buddhist understanding, yoga means a union with your own true nature. That's the, and that's how it's been, been translated. So the first of these, Kriya Tantra, emphasizes external rituals. The second of these, which in the new translation school is called Charya Tantra, and in the old translation school is called Upa Tantra, Upa Yoga, is a balance between the first and the third. And the third one principally emphasizes meditation and not much external. So in, the, in our quotation from the Tantra, it says, Kriya Yoga Tajuche. The difference between the Kriya Tantra and Yoga Tantra is in the view and conduct. Kriya Tantra, basically, you view yourself as other than the deity. In Yoga Tantra, you view yourself as being the deity. Upa Yoga, which means the practice of both, or segue, or Charya Tantra, is a little bit of both. So in Charya Tantra, you view yourself as being the deity, as in Yoga Tantra, but just to be sure, you're also very, very concerned with external rituals like washing and so on. So those are the three uh, outer tantras. And to give you a practical example of these that you may have seen, the practice of myungne, the gen that is a practice of Kriya Tantra. That's what Kriya Tantra is like. And the, uh, what you would call the long Tara practice, that's a practice of Charya uh, Tantra. That's what Charya Tantra is like. Then they come to the inner tantras. The quotation says, Sangha chinang zhe chi The um, difference between the outer and inner uh, tantras is in the substance. Now, this can mean the, the offerings used and so on, the types of tormas and whatnot, but it can also refer to the level of mind that you are seeking to work with. In the higher tantras, what they all have in common is they are seeking to access in different ways what we would call very subtle uh, consciousness, the very subtle uh, uh, true nature of the mind. And they can be divided into three. The quotation says, the difference between uh, maha yoga, and I'll explain what that means, and anu yoga, is that the one is the practice of generation, which I'll explain, and the other is the practice of completion. And then I'd save the last line of the quotation from later, for later. The inner uh, father tantra, uh, which term is mo mostly used by the new translation school and refers to tantras like Guya Samaja. Uh, mother tantra, which refers to tantras like Chakra Sambara and Vajrayogini and non-dual tantra, which refers uh, to, um, hevad, uh, to, in the new translation school, to Kala Chakra and according to some Hevadra. And in the Nyingma terminology, Maha Yoga, which means great yoga, Anu Yoga, which means even greater yoga, or subsequent yoga, and Ati Yoga, which means the greatest yoga there could ever be. I mean, these are terms, anu and ati, these are terms you use even in Hindi to indicate things. They're not that ar ar arcane. So it's like great, even better, even greater, and greatest. Anu is a comparative, and ati is a superlative. You know, when you say greater and greatest. The school teachers here get, get what I mean. <laughs> so um, these really correspond, he's saying here, not so much to different texts, well, they do, but, and different systems, but to different stages of practice. So he says, the inner father tantra, mother tantra, and non-dual tantra of the new tantras, and the corresponding maha yoga, anu yoga, and ati yoga of the old tantras, are the generation stage, the channels and winds, and maha mudra, or the great perfection. In practice, they are the same. So generation means, is defined as 
Meditation on an imaginary deity. Completion is defined as meditation on an actual deity. But completion has two ways to do it. One is where there's still some fiddling, some technique. And that's what Terchen Dorje here refers to as the channels and winds. Winds means prana. And the other is no fiddling. No, it's technically it's called the completion stage without attributes. And that means the, uh, the final essence. And so he says that final essence is Mahamudra or the great perfection, and in practice they are the same. So to complete the quotation, the difference between the first eight yanas and the final yana, which consists of Mahamudra in the new school, or uh, Mahasamdi, the great perfection, in the old school, the quotation says, and this is the most important line, Tegje ati lodeche. The difference between the first eight yanas or vehicles and ati yoga, or we, in the new school they'd say Mahamudra, is that the ninth vehicle transcends the intellect. It does not make use of the conceptual mind. Everything up to that is still using the conceptual mind. So all of that is kind of really a, an introduction to now he's going to talk about how to do that. Omache, <coughs> now, um, now, the next section, he concludes the sort of the theoretical presentation. What he's doing here is he's trying to show the person to whom he wrote the song, Karma Yeshe, that these two traditions, the new translation school and the old translation school, come you know, when push comes to shove, come down to the same practice. You're doing the same thing. And, but just before he describes what that same thing finally is and how to do it, he addresses the last remaining objection that the, presumably this person, Karma Yeshe, was wondering about how to put all this together and whether he was doing the right thing. So the final thing that Terchen Dorji deals with, the final sort of brush of dogma, he has brushwood of dogma he has to clear, clear away, is the notion of whose view is better, whose meditation is better, and who achieves the kind of fruition. Because in Tibetan Buddhism, you have this, the statement that the ultimate view is Majamaka, the great middle way. There is no view greater than that. Then you also have people saying, well, the ultimate thing is Mahamudra, because it's the conate. It's the discovery of that wisdom which has always been within us. And then there are other people say, well, no, Mahasandhi, the great perfection, is ultimate because it takes the fruition, the trikaya, uh, on the path. So, so he says, yes, to all. The essence of the view is the great middle way. The middle way explanation of reality is the final and definitive statement of what the Buddha, his intention. But how do you meditate on that? The way to meditate on that is the discovery of that which is conate, that which was the, the wisdom that has always been within you along with ignorance, which is called Mahamudra. And it is true that the great perfection takes the fruition as the path. And so he says, therefore, they use different terminology. But they all come down to the same thing. And in the next four lines, he, he, he says, there are many and varied terms include 
wisdom empty of subject and object. The final um, discovery or, um, of the middle way is that the expanse, the Dharma Dhatu, is self-cognizant. It is wisdom. It knows itself. Because otherwise, that which realizes the Dharma Dhatu would have to be dualistic if it's other than the Dharma Dhatu itself. So therefore, the Dharma Dhatu recognizes itself, and that is wisdom empty of subject and, and object. The Mahamudra term for this is natural, ordinary cognition. The Mahamudra tradition, they don't talk so much about this, uh, the Dharma Dhatu and that. They just say it's natural, ordinary cognition. And in the Mahasamdhi, the Great Perfection, they typically talk about a spontaneously present nature, character, and compassion. The nature of the mind is emptiness. The character of the mind is it's not just emptiness, it's character. What makes us call it a mind is, is lucidity, it can know. And the compassion or goodness of the mind is that it can experience an infinite variety. It's responsive to infinite amount, potentially infinite amounts of information. It's not homogenous in the sense that the mind the mind is not limited by anything except the sense organs of the, that particular life. ตาเตคังกาเตมิงตันโซคังกาเตทรุมเซกลอนโดเลชวนจันจันเรติโยเรสยันตาทอมลามาจูเปริกวะสมาจูยาเลสตายันตาเปกทอนลาอะงอเน
Gavan then 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 drop was a sound sound which town saw in a cure sour is dead or a zambuki yes I am manova. Oh Tanam Dong Yambat Shari in a ten yambatila Tanam Dong Yambadi don't the punk wogan don't then I'm told the Shadjum Mando Samba Tabuk Samu Mamba Y Tama in a room, Nam do take it yes or joke by in a room, that I've John Sava Yena, then Yanda Tanam. Ma ciò che non è un problema è che se si fa una cosa, si fa una cosa che non è un problema. Se si fa una cosa che non è un problema, si fa una cosa che non è un problema. Se si fa una cosa che non è un problema, si fa una Tagara get told a coran ya, take it yes or a numdo toa in a yan, Tagara, and go on a yan, para, machi, palatan, no tobatella, teneri was so under so under us. Can't tell, can't tell, Shendo, can't tell, Shendo, be a bajos. I can't tell you that, so you get. Shin Tate Kanta Yena Yarong to Tap, but a Zambo Yena Tando Yar and Dova la Chuya, Tangemba Yena Tando de Gayak Namdo la Chuya and Dava Tel Jajo selling Sando. Jajo Mepa Hirak Karkin Bori is a wonder. Or Dado Yang Sek Chicks. Nada Nang Sepatan. De la Shana. Tanga O Yumbeke Dad in the Bati Pad. Non <laughs> Oh, then Ilashana, Telagas, Telagas, they get some of the cheat and hungry, cheat and hungry. The um, the stanzas, the division into stanzas, um, in English was. Uh, required of me by the publisher um, because people don't like they need they, nowadays books have to be mostly blank and um, so but it's it's me that divided them I mean they're not into stanzas so there we try to do it by break it up based on topic which is how I tried to do it there so we're trying to do it that here now The next bit, we could call it the next stanza, that starts with however and ends with is the point, is um, the, the, the central part uh, of the song. Because up to this point, what Terchen Barwe Dorje has explained, um, along with important issues of behavior and the value of refuge and bodhicitta and so on, um, ha, is how um, the classifications of different levels of the teachings and different classifications of them come down to the same thing. And especially how this middle way and Mahamudra and Dzogchen traditions are all trying to point out uh, the same uh, thing. So now he's going to talk about, well, what is that thing and how do we get at that thing? He says, however, more important than their individual positions and ideas. 
In fact, the positions and ideas, Rinpoche said, he's just given you three, you know, the wisdom empty of subject and object as a characteristic jargon of the Middle Way School, and natural ordinary cognition as the Mahamudra, and spontaneously present nature, character, and compassion uh, as of, of Dzogchen. But they have hundreds and hundreds of different terms. And there are subdivisions within each of these traditions that disagree with one another and criticize one another and use different terms and so on. So if you want to get into that stuff, it's endless. But his point here is that since we've defined the ninth vehicle, what we're ultimately trying to practice, whether we call it Mahamudra or Dzogchen, doesn't matter, as the transcendence of the intellect, it would be beside the point to spend too much time learning more ideas. Because it says any position is an idea. Even if it's a correct position, or more or less correct position, it's an idea. It's a function of the intellect. And obviously, terminology is too. So he says, more important than their individual positions and ideas is their authentic meaning. What are they trying to get at? What are they trying to describe? And especially, what are they trying to help us learn to do? What do we actually do? How do you actually do this? And he answers that in one line, initially. And then there are two lines that reinforce it. The one line is their authentic meaning, resting freely in fresh, unaltered awareness. Now, we have to, Rimshay broke this down very, very carefully, because there are actually five things contained in this line. What you're doing, which is resting, how you're resting freely, and what you are resting in, awareness. What are the attributes of that awareness, freshness, and the absence of alteration? So all of these, each of these things means something specific that needs to be understood. First of all, the way to um, recognize and familiarize yourself with what is described in all of these wonderful traditions and in their elegant and beautiful language is not by thinking about it. You can't figure it out. The more you search for it, the more you'll discover that there's, you're not going to find anything. So the only alternative to that, which is always an intellectual pursuit, is to stop looking and rest. Just rest. But how do you rest? You rest Freely. Now, freely here, the word that I translated freely is chogar, chogar shak or chok shak. Um, and chogar means totally, completely, without reservation. It's, it also can mean, has a connotation of a flat surface, because it's related to the word, you know, for a table. But it just means completely, flatly, just letting something f totally flop. It's like, um, a, when a leaf just settles down on the ground. Till it's on the ground, it's not quite there. And then it just settles and it sort of, so it doesn't have a connotation of hitting bottom emotionally, but it means getting, just resting totally. And what are you resting in? What state is that resting? It's a state of uh, rikpa or awareness. Now, awareness here means that your mind has the ability to experience itself. Not as an object. Your mind obviously can't be seen as an object. But your mind has the ability to experience itself. For example, in a very simple mundane example is you don't need to figure out how you're feeling. Your mind is not concealed from you. The only thing your mind, the only thing your mind is not concealed from is your mind. But 
that awareness can be led astray, which is our common state. So in order to return that awareness to a state of complete and free rest, it needs to have two attributes, freshness and absence of alteration. Now, freshness means that there is no concept about what is happening. So it means direct experience. For example, if I think about the past, that is not fresh, that's stale. Past is gone. And unaltered awareness means no manipulation. Now we'll come back to the no manipulation again, because at this point, Rumshay talked about a lot about what freshness means. Freshness, resting freely in freshness, is about not doing things. And there are um, three things not to do. First thing is called prolonging the past. Now, prolonging the past in a coarse, gross sense means thinking about the past. In a subtle sense, it means holding on to a thought that is vanishing, that is passing out of existence. That's prolonging the past. The second thing not to do is beckoning the future. Beckoning the future in a gross sense, is thinking or planning when you're supposed to be meditating. But in a subtle sense, it's lying in wait for the next thought. It's not being content with what's in your mind at the moment. And the third thing is picking and choosing within the present. And this means, in the gross sense, thinking about the present moment of experience rather than experiencing it. But in the subtle sense, it means acceptance or rejection of a thought that is present in your mind at any time. Rimshe said, for example, if you're, you've let go of the previous thought, you're not lying in wait for the next thought, but a thought arises in your mind. And usually, we do one of two things with thoughts. Thoughts themselves are not a problem. They've never been a problem. The problem is what we do because of our thoughts. And we do two things, and they're both equally wrong. The first thing he said is acceptance. And that's when a thought arises and you think, oh, this is a good thought. I need to hold on to this thought, keep it there. Or this is a pleasant thought. I'm enjoying this thought. I don't want it to end. And the other is rejection, where you think, that's a shameful thought, and you try to suppress it. Or, this is a painful thought. I don't want to have this painful thought, and you try to chase it out. Both of those are problems. So what's the alternative? Is there a third alternative? The third alternative is freshness, where if, as, if the thought's there, it's there. You don't try to keep it there. You don't try to, to destroy it. And if you sustain that freshness, then the thought will just subside of itself and won't create karma because you're not holding on to it. We create karma with thoughts by accepting and rejecting them. Now, what about unaltered, the, the fifth and final point? So we have resting freshly, awareness, resting freely, awareness, freshness, and unaltered. Rimshay said this is, this is uh, a, a, an issue that we need to explore and understand, because obviously, in the beginning, meditation is anything but unaltered. Every, in every tradition, whether Buddhist or otherwise, you begin with some object of meditation. And the object of meditation serves simply as an anchor or an alarm, basically, to alert you to when you're distracted. 
So for example, one of the most common techniques is following the breath. So you follow the breath. And the purpose of following the breath is not because following the breath does something. The purpose of following the breath is so that you have something you're supposed to be doing, so that when you're not doing it, you notice that you're not doing it. But in fact, techniques like following the breath, meditation with any kind of intentional direction, focus, or content, are the cultivation of controlled states of distraction. It's necessary in the beginning because you have to limit your distractions to one distraction. OK, instead of being distracted by everything, I'll let myself just be distracted by my breath. And then if you find yourself thinking about your car, you know, oh no, <laughs> back to the breath. <laughs> but the breath itself, being focused on the breath, is a distraction. So really, Rinpoche said, meditation does not have an object. In that sense, there is no meditation, per se. It is simply resting freely in fresh, unaltered awareness. Now, Tejan Bawa Dorji concludes this section, which we've made this stanza, with two lines that um, reinforce his point. I have no idea what time it is. What time is it? It's noon? Oh, then it talked about it. The first is, is, what are we trying to do in doing this? And we have to be tricky in saying trying to do because we are trying to we, obviously, we are intentionally sitting there and meditating. It says, the exhaustion of the intellect is the aim. All you are trying to do is abstain from the intellect's meddling. That's all this is. That's why freshness, lack of alteration, and so on are important. And therefore, he says, Freedom from contrivance and alteration is the point. In the beginning, our practice is totally about contrivance and alteration. Contrivance is when you try to um, imagine something or create something. An alteration, of course, is when you try to control what's going on in your mind. But although we begin that way, ultimately, uh, that's not what meditation